What is today? Today is the day of Pentecost. We have been spending from Easter until now preparing ourselves for this event. We've talked about what Jesus came to do on the cross. He came to tell us about the Father. He came to show to us what the kingdom of God is. He shows us it's a correction of even the religion of the Pharisees. He said to them, I find fault in your interpretation of the law. So he came to correct the religious institution. He came to correct how society dwells with each other. He gave many parables to show how inconsistent we are with each other. He came to show what God expected individuals in their own personal life. To be like. Don't, don't live for outward. Live from here. Don't, don't make yourself look good to others and then go live like the devil uh, on your weekdays. So Jesus came to, I, I've talked about paradigm shifts every week. It seems like I've mentioned it and I'll do it this time because Jesus changed the way the world is. If you look back 2,000 years and look at how the world has changed, it's because of the Spirit of God in individuals. God has given knowledge to man through the Spirit. And so we, it's not just a religious thing, it's in every aspect of our life. In nations, how nations view God depends on the blessing that they receive. Nations that abandon God their children perish in lack of hunger. Wherever God is, there's prosperity and blessing. And uh, of course the devil's at work too. And he's trying to show his benefits and his controlling of the world. This is his world until Christ comes to establish his kingdom forever. Until the tribulation comes, the devil is still the little G-O-D of this world. So these dynamics are at play. Jesus revealed more about Satan than any other person because Satan was with the Father in the beginning. And so Jesus came to establish the church to be the foot that's on the head of Satan to his demise. And so all of these things came out of the cross. But Jesus said, if this is all, if, if being good is all there is, you don't need this. If you can be good... You don't need the cross. But we can't. Jesus said there's none that is righteous. No, not one. So we, we feel that 
Jesus coming has done many things that we take for granted. We don't know that it's directly in correlation with Him, but I'm telling you it is. Today is the day of Pentecost. What does it mean to the church? Well, we could, we could call this the birthday of the church. The church was born on Pentecost. I spent two Sundays talking about Israel's Pentecost and how the people of God were supposed to be what the church is today. God wanted Israel to evangelize the world. But they took it upon themselves to say, no, we're going to stay in ourself and just us. We don't need the, you to go out. And, you got us. What else do you need? But God wants every human being that was ever born. His mercy is extended through the cross to the vilest of sinners. It's incredible what God has done in Christ. But he wanted Israel initially to share in that glory. And when they went up to the mountain of God, God came down to meet them personally. And they said to God, no, you, you go back and... and, and we, you tell Moses what you want, and we'll do it. We're all in favor of all you do, but just don't talk to us in person. It scares us. <clears throat> and the church has today has basically said the same thing. Pentecost has become a meaningless calendar event. You know, we, we give a little token about the Holy Spirit up there, out there, you know, at work. And, and, and I've, I've been preaching this now for about two years, that the revelation of God to me is that God intended every one of us. He made us holy through the death on the cross. He died for our sin not just as a token, but it's, it's a purpose-driven thing that he did. Him dying and us believing makes you and me 100% holy. It's not because we're righteous and upright and, and sit up straight in the pews and do all the right stuff has nothing to do with our appearance. It has to do with the fact that the living God came down and lived in a man. We don't think about it like that. We think of Jesus being God. Well, He was God before He came, after He came, as a man. He was still God. But he did nothing miraculous. He did not do anything other than be a human. Until the Holy Spirit came upon him. And Jesus kept telling the people. And I've, I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks going over this, talking about what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. And Jesus was an example to all humanity of what can happen to a normal human being when the Spirit of God comes upon him. And the Word of God is in him. Now, Jesus spent every Sabbath reading aloud 
the Word of God. From the time he was 13 or 14, Luke says, as it was his custom, that Jesus read the Word of God. So he knew the Word of God. The Word of God was in him. You are no different than what Jesus. You prepare yourselves with the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Pentecost is when God Himself came and dwelt, indwelt the 120 who were in the upper room. They believed in Jesus Christ. They were waiting for Him. He said, it's expedient for you. It's absolutely essential for you that I go away. For if I don't go away, He cannot come. And when He comes, He's going to reveal everything that I said to you. And, and by the way, everything He said to you is in the Word of God. So, we have the mind of Christ, the Word of God, the Heavenly Father's entrance through the Old Testament, and Jesus through the New, and now the Holy Spirit in us brings it all together. And when He comes down, He's not just the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. He's the one who comes to live within. So God is in you, the hope of glory. Now that's the introduction to Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. They believe that. And that belief makes them holy. They were all waiting as Jesus told them. Don't go out and try to be Christians on your own. I, I've said that every week now for three weeks. Do not try to go out and do this on your own. You can't do it. You can't be good. You can't do right on your own. We are selfish human beings. We do what we do for our benefit. God said the greater good is to do all that you do as unto me. But we can't do that on our own. And suddenly, just like Israel, they went up to the mountain and all of a sudden, the mountain became a pillar of smoke. And there was great thunderings. And the earth shook. And they were all like, we are out of here. This scares us to death. We don't, God is too spooky. Moses, you take care of it. So, the church experienced it like this. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. And I've said this in the past. Imagine a hurricane. 200 mile an hour winds. And, and we can... That wakes you up, doesn't it? We, we've had the Holy Spirit coming. That They heard that. 
and a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house. You know, you hear the tornado coming and it's blocks away, but you can hear it coming. And all of a sudden, all of the air in your house sucks out and the walls begin to collapse. Well, they're waiting for this to happen. We hear the wind blowing. We're anticipating the house to fall any second now. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. Remember when Jesus was baptized? The description given was it was like a dove coming down out of heaven and landing upon him. And we see paintings that artist conceptions of the Holy Spirit, but it's it's something external. It's something outside of the believer. Not really indicative of what just happened. Jesus was just a normal human being like you and me. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and filled him. And then the voice of God said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so in that moment, the, the picture we get is the dove is descending, but, but picture it like this. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, flames, well, well, you know, that reminds me of the, uh, the cross that the Methodist Church uses. The Methodist Church has given this their symbol. Wesley believed in, in a second touch. And, and he said that this flame represents the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This wasn't something external. It was internal. Each one of them became like Jesus with the Father. He is taking on your flesh. You become like Jesus was. A human being filled with the Spirit. But they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A miracle in itself. And we're, I won't even get into all that that implied. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout Jews from every nation under heaven. It, it, see, this, this is the thing. In Jude, Judaism, the Jews were required to come to the temple to offer sacrifices. They couldn't do it anywhere but Jerusalem. If they brought an offering to God, they put it on the altar in Jerusalem. The sacrifices, the offerings, everything went there. So people were coming from all over the world to go to Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And when this sound occurred, and, and obviously this sound occurred in a region, and, and I want to just throw in a little sideline. 
Where was the upper room? Do you realize that in Acts it says they were up in the upper room praying when Peter was thrown in prison. This was the home of Mary, the mother of Mark, who wrote the book of Mark. He was there during this time. It was in his house that this occurred. He was a young boy, probably 13, 14 years old, watching all this happen. Can you imagine how that would influence you? Wow, this is... Uh, he had gone through the cross, and now 40 days later, they were in the house waiting for God, promised to come. Wait in Jerusalem until you have been endued with power. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together. I mean, we're talking, the whole city was aware that something was going on here. Listen to that sound. And everybody's waiting for the, the storm to blow through, but it didn't. There was no storm. No damage came from the mighty rushing wind. And they were confused. And everyone heard them speak in his own language. We will never know the full extent of what happened there. Uh, everybody has their own theological take on tongues and uh, all of that, but it, it's, it's a part of the birth of the church. And so at this point, they opened their mouths and said things they didn't know. But it was the Holy Spirit in them speaking words that they'd never heard before. They didn't know what they meant. They were just, it's, it's called glossolalia. That, that's the, the Greek word for that. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look! Aren't these folks all from Sam Springs? What are they doing speaking Greek and Hebrew and uh, Aramaic and, and Rome, Roman and, and every nation's language? Everybody, wherever you were from, you heard them speaking in your own language. You understood exactly what they were saying. And how it is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born. And so they were all amazed and perplexed and saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they're full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk with wine, as you suppose. Since it's only nine o'clock in the morning, nobody's had time to get drunk yet. So it's not that these people have been out drinking all night and they're drunk. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And if you want to know what that is, I preached it last Sunday. In preparation for today, and it was on Mother's Day that I did that because I, I spoke to mothers that how the... Let, let me just say it again here. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass in the last days. That was considered... Joel was 
500 years before Jesus. And, and it says, he said then, and in the last days, so these are considered the last days from the time of the outpouring of the Spirit until now is considered the last days. That I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and on my maid servants. This is not a respecter of our male or femaleness. God has poured out His Spirit upon all flesh. I will pour out my Spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is foretelling what's going to happen. Well, as we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see what the prophetic utterance of Jesus was pertaining to His death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. And then we read further in the book of Acts, the works of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And that's where we're going to be going with Pentecost. I've gotten us ready for it. Now it's come. Let us pray. Oh God, you are living in us. Forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. For your name's sake, as we are called by your name, we are Christians. We are a holy people, a royal priesthood, a chosen people. Lord, come, fulfill in us all that you intended for Jesus coming and dying and ascending to accomplish. Use us, Father, to bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.